About six years ago, I lost my job and I, it was quite a difficult experience for me. So after a few months of not really handling it very well, I saw a psychiatrist who prescribed this pregabalin for anxiety. This is what Jane Evans is talking about, a drug used for epilepsy, nerve pain or for anxiety. While for many it is a safe and effective treatment, it is also highly addictive and in 2019 was put on the controlled drug list requiring extra safety measures for storage, supply and prescription. Was it explained to you the risks associated with it? No, not at all. And as I understood it, it was a drug that was being used uh, in, as a, an alternative to benzodiazepines, like diazepam, um, because it wasn't as addictive. Uh, so I had a completely different idea about what the drug was uh, capable of. Ms Evans has now been on it for six years. Every time she's tried to come off it, she's felt so awful, she's given in. I feel really frustrated. I just want, really, really want the drug out of my body. But now, after a few years of knowing more about the drug, I know that that's going to be a really, really long process. In fact, such is the concern over pregabalin's addictive qualities and because of a sharp rise in deaths, doctors in Northern Ireland were last year told to stop prescribing it for neuropathic pain. This has not happened in the rest of the UK. Now figures obtained by Channel 4 News show that over the last six years, the number of patients in England receiving prescribed pregabalin has risen from just over 495,000 to nearly 750,000, a 51% increase, despite it being made a controlled drug three years ago. And deaths in which pregabalin was one of the drugs involved have jumped from 86 in 2015 to 382 last year. That's a 344% increase, a faster rise in fatalities than with any other drug, including heroin. In 2019, an Oxford University study using a huge data set from Sweden found a 26% increased risk of suicidal behaviours in adolescents and young adults taking pregabalin. We found that there was an excess of um, suicidal behaviours, particularly for pregabalin in younger people. And by younger I mean under the age of 25. And there was also an excess of unintentional overdoses, so accidental overdoses. And also um, some uh, excess of injuries, particularly to the head um, and, the, and, and limbs. And that's, again, just accidents generally. Um, there was a signal. And, and finally, for road traffic accidents as well, there was a, um, an increased risk. They don't know why, but the theory is that they may be using them with other drugs and alcohol and that younger people are generally more impulsive. Here's another headline the inquest into the death of 32-year-old Jack Wade. He was very articulate, he was intelligent, he was very, very witty, always alive and so. Louise Emerson says her son's problems began with drugs prescribed after he broke his foot. His mental health deteriorated and by the end he was, she says, in a dark place. Where were the questions being asked about why he was taking them? Well, you see, Jack told me that it was all to do with, you know, mental health again, it's, it's um, bipolar and anxiety and... So I just, well, you assume, don't you, that he's taking medication that's being prescribed to him, so I'm assuming that the experts know what they're doing. I am starting to think now that it's, it's all a bit of a lottery and it's a bit hit and miss. I just uh, was assuming and hoping that the experts knew what they were doing and it was sort of st stabilising him. And you don't think that now? Probably not. A post-mortem and toxicology tests found potentially lethal levels of morphine as well as pregabalin. The cause of death was given as drug poisoning. Jack's pregabalin was prescribed. But now police forces across the UK are warning of a growing trade in the drug which is sold as gabbies or buds on the streets and in prisons. Dr Adam Winstock is a consultant psychiatrist who works with yeah. prisoners trying to help them with their dependency. 
unfortunately what I see is a revolving door of people coming in on medication, us removing that medication and then returning to the community and being put back on it, which is frustrating for them, frustrating for us, but ultimately my concern is I don't want to be prescribing a drug that I think is going to increase the risk of death and cause other sorts of harm. We can see from the figures that deaths have been going up, so something has to happen. Absolutely, and doctors ultimately need to change the way they prescribe. They need to decide whether this is a genuine indication, they need to look for all safer alternatives. We asked the Medicines and Healthcare Regulatory Authority, the MHRA, why they were not recommending the same restrictions as Northern Ireland. They said, When used as directed by the instructions for use, pregabalin is an acceptably safe and effective treatment for the management of pain, and we're not considering any urgent regulatory action on it. We keep the safety of all medicines under close review and continue to monitor suspected adverse drug reactions for pregabalin including reports of misuse and dependency. And yet dependent is precisely how Jane Evans describes herself. She is, she says, an addict, desperate to be weaned off a drug that she was told would help her. Well, joining me now is Dr Alan Stout, who's chair of the British Medical Association's GP committee and himself a GP based in Belfast. Dr Stout, I suppose the first thing to say for anyone who is taking pregabalin and is concerned, they should seek medical advice, presumably, before trying to come off it. It needs supervision. It's not something you just do. No, absolutely. You, you do not. Uh, you need to speak to your own doctor, and, you, and your own doctor will be very supportive uh, in terms of trying to get you off it. Uh, and actually, the case studies that you've just presented are, are hugely familiar to, I think, every GP, uh, not only in terms of the addictive nature of it, but also people who have been on it uh, for a long period of time who really do want to come off it and, uh, and are struggling uh, significantly with that. So it, it is very, very important to seek that help. Is there any reason why its use is rising? Yeah, I mean, there's, there's quite a number of reasons, and we saw a particular problem in Northern Ireland, which is why we changed uh, and, and removed it from the formulary. Um, and some of those reasons uh, are relating to mental health, some of those on the increased incidence of mental health, some of them are related to deprivation as well, and we see quite particular patterns uh, in areas of deprivation. But also one of the, uh, the things that we're seeing very uh, much at the moment right across the UK is the length of the waiting lists uh, and the need to, to prescribe uh, more and more medications whilst patients are actually waiting uh, for definitive treatment, uh, which will remove the need for, for a lot of the medication uh, that they're on. And again, Northern Ireland, it's no surprise, we've had very, very long waiting lists uh, for a very long period of time, way, way before COVID uh, caused a, a, another problem. Um, and, and we saw the, the effect of that and the legacy of that. I mean, people might be surprised that there are different regulations for drug prescription in Northern Ireland and, uh, well, the, the four nations, in fact. I mean, do, do you think England, Wales and Scotland should be doing the same thing as Northern Ireland in this respect? Yeah, I think they should. I mean, yeah, I mean, we, we have seen quite a, a downturn in terms of the prescribing. Removing it from the formula isn't actually changing the regulations, but what it does is it very much encourages whoever the prescriber is, be it a, a GP or a hospital prescriber, to really think uh, and be aware of the implications and the long-term implications. But also, very, very importantly, uh, it does create quite a significant messaging to the to the general public, either if you're on the, the medication already or if you're considering it or, or it's being considered for your management. Uh, and that is really important uh, just in terms of getting that message across, looking at alternatives uh, and being able to, to try and seek those alternatives as well. Is it always addictive or is it only in certain circumstances with certain people? No, it, I mean, the nature of it is that it is an addictive drug uh, and, and just the manner of its, of its work. Uh, and it's not unique in that. We have uh, various other drugs uh, often used for exactly the same conditions that are also addictive uh, as well. So quite often, and it's really important to emphasize that, uh, that in many, many cases, it's not the patient's fault uh, that they become addicted or they become dependent on it. Um, it is something that, uh, that, that will happen uh, with with time and just with the with the nature of the drug, 
But it's also important to emphasize that a lot of patients, uh, particularly those that, that may have been waiting a long time for treatment, uh, have no other option. So they have tried a lot of the alternatives um, and, uh, and they find that, that pregabalin is the only drug uh, that helps. Um, and, and it's important not to increase uh, concern and increase anxiety in that particular group of patients, uh, because if it does work and, and it is impossible to switch you, uh, I don't think any clinician would be would be trying to do that or trying to, to cause any undue suffering for a patient. So, so you do regard it as effective? Oh, it is. In a, in a huge number of cases, it is effective. Uh, but you do see these pockets and you see the percentages that, uh, that you're presenting tonight uh, that show that it does cause those problems uh, and it does cause that addiction and, and the follow-on effects from that, unfortunately.